in battle gear, the helmet holding the door open for me. By what magic and miracle could I have conceived the thought that I'll marry him a year later in Paris and he will bring me home to this country, which I so proudly claim my own. This country has given me everything. Slowly, I was able to cautiously understand its freedom. Sorrow turned into joy, and finally death into life when our children and grandchildren were born. It was here, too, that I was given the incredible opportunity to become what I always wanted to be, a wife, a mother, and also a writer. Only in America. I have no education to speak of, and English is my third language. But here I was asked not what my degrees were, but show me what you're going, what you can do. How blessed we are. In my years of slavery, I dreamt of freedom, of a home, a family, and never to be hungry again. My dreams were fulfilled in a measure I could not even have thought possible. Of course, survival is an incredible privilege. It is also a very deep obligation. It's an obligation to share the unfulfilled dreams of all those who never knew the joy of freedom, never sat down to a meal with their family, never held a child in their arms. And of course, the corresponding part of this obligation is to address in this free country where I can say right now what I wish to say without fear that the Gestapo will come and take me away. To say that I am pained beyond measure, that there are hungry children in this world, that they hate and the <coughs> persecution and all those things are still aware aware because we can turn on the television sets and the radios and all the things they know about it, that we must scream back and say, it cannot, it must not happen again to anybody, anywhere. You were good enough to mention my speech at the United Nations. It was one of the most difficult days of my life. How can one, in any existing words, speak on behalf of millions not just Holocaust survivors, but millions of people who have been oppressed. I couldn't. The only thing I could do is stand there in this hall which is dedicated to humanity, to the Charter. I remember when Mrs. Roosevelt held it, I saw it in a newspaper, I was still in Europe. The Charter of Human Rights. I thought the world will never know what we have seen. And I, as I stood there, I begged that every child born today of every race, of every color, of every religion, any place in the world, should be able to look up to the stars in freedom and dream their dreams. That was what the United Nations was built for. I prayed and I begged that it should become a sanctuary in which it would be fulfilled. You will fulfill it. 
I hope that all those young people whom I have the privilege of talking tonight, I marvel. Is someone among them going to be the leader of the free world? Will someone perhaps find a cure for cancer or some other dread disease? Will someone just write a children's poem which will become immortal? I will not see it, but I pray that it should be. A couple of things amongst the many I should like to share with you is probably one of the saddest moments that I experienced in this country. It was in April of 1999. when my beloved husband, whom I lost five years ago, and I got a call from Columbine High School when the tragedy occurred. How can it happen here? Among the majesty of the Rocky Mountain, Columbine, where two boys were planning for an entire year to kill their classmates and their teachers. And Hitler's birthday, as you know, in honor of Hitler. Apparently, the kids could not talk to any grown-ups, to any teachers or guidance counselors or parents. So the principal called us knowing my story, and said, perhaps they will talk to you because you were your age when it was happening. And we did. And I told them, I have seen my friends killed in honor, quote unquote, of Hitler. But only after I became a mother and a grandmother could I truly understand what happened to me as a teenager. And I embraced the kids. They're still friends. A few months ago, I was at Columbine when we dedicated the memorial. But for me, the greatest comfort and the sorrow was the fact that when September 11th happened, the kids from Columbine went to New York and Washington to help their contemporaries. I feel particularly privileged whenever I'm in a school because to me the greatest and noblest profession of them all is to become a teacher. The teachers are my heroes. In my years of slavery, when I had no role models, I harked back to the things my parents, my brother, and my teachers told us. In all honesty, I never thought that I listened too carefully, but something must have stayed. A certain understanding the teachers try to impart. Because it's the teachers who influence our young people, who broaden their horizons, their thoughts, the maturity and gives them the reach toward things which can be possible. During those years, the words of my teachers became my lodestar. I never had the opportunity to thank my teachers or my parents. But I always like to speak to teachers and future teachers and tell them of my gratitude for what they have done. It might not always be obvious, you get very frustrated, but you really never know when you can implant a spark in someone's heart or brain which will reach to some greatness. I have been very privileged, as you know. So much has been given to me that I could have never believed possible. And one can never give enough back.